Yeah. So like he, I think he did a podcast recently with you and then also Thomas DeLauer and yeah. he mentioned how the Hadza, when he went to um, visit with them and, you know, live their lifestyle and whatnot, is they were using vegetables for medicinal purposes was like their actual claimed purpose of them. So is that something that like I, in general, I know you're not like totally against the notion of using, you know, supplements or like phytochemicals, like where warranted, but you just assert that you could probably gain the majority of the benefits from lifestyle, like hormetic stressors and whatnot. But like when you have the hods of themselves saying there's like medicinal benefits to vegetables, like what do you, where do you see that kind of like intersect? Like how do you, how do you go from they're problematic and they're good to like, how do you even know how to incorporate it when you're following this like carnivore based diet model? Yeah, yeah, this is a super important point that I've tried to communicate to people, but it's interesting and it's been an evolution too. So I definitely think that plants, and we mentioned this briefly at the beginning of the podcast, plants contain chemicals that have physiologic actions in humans. This is not debatable. What I want to try and communicate to people is this question. When you are looking at a plant compound, let's consider the benefits and the risks. I think a lot of these plant compounds, because they're often sold as supplements, we really just focus on the benefits. And a lot of the studies or research that looks at potential side effects is ignored. Metformin is a great example. And metformin is in some ways a derivative of a plant compound. It's from a French lilac. And metformin itself doesn't occur in the French lilac, but compounds that are used to synthesize metformin do. And berberine is similar, although slightly, it's a different molecule from a bark. So a lot of these compounds do occur in plants and can have physiologic effects in humans. But I think it's interesting to look at them and say, okay, should you eat this every day as a food? Is this a food or is it a medicine? Because if you're going to take a plant compound to affect a physiologic reaction in your body, then that's great, but understand that that's going to have a side effect. Like every other pharmaceutical, you're going to get at a pharmacy, whether it's metoprolol, rosuvastatin, simvastatin, or omeprazole, right? Because within medicine, we always know these drugs have side effects. There's no perfect drug that goes in and only does one thing. Statins, for instance, they don't just affect, you know, HMG CoA reductase. They do all sorts of things. I mean, there's all sorts. HMG CoA reductase is such an important part of the mevalonate pathway that it affects so many things in the human body. But you know, there's so many molecules like this, which have all these disparate effects in the human body. And we have to understand that. So plant compounds, and this is kind of the beginning was one of the things I thought about at the beginning of this carnivore diet. Like, I think we've got plant compounds a little bit. We've given them too much free reign. Too, we've given a lot of free Paul passes to the plant compounds and said, oh, look, turmeric does this. There's like one or two studies of people with OA, osteoarthritis pain with turmeric. That's a freaking great molecule. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. There's a lot of studies with turmeric that suggest that it's not great. I mean, I asked Andrew Huberman to send me the study, but he didn't send it to me. I was talking to him the other night. Uh, he was in Costa Rica and he was like, yeah, there's some studies that show that turmeric decreases testosterone. I was like, that's fascinating because we, yeah. It's a, uh, it interacts with AR more so than actually inhibiting steroidogenesis from what I've seen. So it's like a mild anti-androgen. So that's interesting, right? Yeah. And so then we're deepening the, we're deepening our understanding of molecules like turmeric, which affects potassium channels. And apparently it looks like it can affect P53 and affect thyroidoxin reductase. And so then we have to look at turmeric, for instance, as a model and say, okay, these are the benefits. These are the side effects. We've mostly forgotten about the plant side effects for us. And, and then these plant compounds get pushed to the forefront because people are like, oh, you get these people with like polypharmacy of supplements and they're taking sulforaphane and turmeric and you know, broccoli seed extract, and they're taking, you know, astaxanthin and a million freaking molecules. And nobody's saying like, oh, astaxanthin actually inhibits 5-alpha reductase too, from what I understand. And like, maybe you don't want to combine all these things. And do you really know that you need all those things? Do they make you better? And then as I got deeper down the rabbit hole, I was like, you know, humans can actually do a lot without these plant compounds if we can establish a good foundation of health. And then how do we do that for us? So that was kind of what I was calling into question, like, where is the relative value of these? And with every compound, like let's, let's have an honest assessment of harms, risks, and net benefit. And then if we're claiming there's a net benefit, let's try and substantiate the fact that that net benefit is something that's not redundant or that, that is actually beneficial for a human. A lot of these are very lofty questions and it's challenging to say sulforaphane, you know, is a net benefit and it's going to give you more glutathione than you could get by doing other things. But 
that I think should be the goal because there's potential downsides of sulforaphane and other <clears throat> molecules like it. Have you ever had Rhonda Patrick reply to you? <laughs> Never once, man. She... Oh, damn. <laughs> I would love to see that. I, would I think it would be, that. I think it would be great. Like I'm super respectful. I've always tried to be respectful of Rhonda. Um, you know, uh, I would love to debate uh, David Sinclair or Rhonda and just, just have a conversation about it and say like, okay, these are the things you're saying are the benefits. Like maybe there's studies I'm not aware of. Like, let's talk about it and understand. Like, for instance, with sulforaphane, like the benefits of sulforaphane appear to be on the NRF2 system. It increases glutathione, which prevents DNA damage. But are we sure that that DNA damage is, is something that we're going to have if we don't have sulforaphane in our diet, right? So that's the question, because there's a lot of ways that you can trigger your NRF2 system. And there's other studies on the other side that suggest that you know, generally antioxidants don't prevent DNA damage for humans and that the endogenous mechanisms, glutathione, superoxide reductase, yada, 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 are pretty good if you're a healthy human. Now, are you a smoker? Are you exposed to tons of heavy metals? There's all sorts of baseline metabolic health and overall sort of, let's call oxidative reductive balance, inflammatory states for humans. But I'm curious and um, at least bias to believe that humans can achieve a lot without these plant compounds. And then we might circumvent some of the bad side effects. And then the question, really interesting question is like, what do these plant compounds do in us long-term, which is a really fascinating rabbit hole to go down. I recently got on this one, again, talking to Andrew Huberman about non-protein amino acids, which are these amino acids that occur in nature that don't occur in the human body or don't get utilized in the translation of proteins in the human body. And their hypothesis, um, I believe the gentleman's name is Rubenstein. I believe he was at Stanford, but he's dead now. But he was very interested in the hypothesis that these non-protein amino acids, predominantly from plant foods, predominantly from seeds and beans, could accumulate in the human body and cause misfolding of proteins. Well, that's an interesting hypothesis. Like if that's contributing to neurodegeneration, we'd wanna know that, you know? And they occur in yeah. things like beets, and alfalfa sprouts. And then maybe they're in seeds that we don't even know about. So it kind of goes back to that original sort of the first principles. And the way I frame this now is like, look, plant leaves, plant stems, plant roots, plant seeds, they don't want to get eaten. They're going to have defense chemicals. Let's be cautious and careful and understand if, if they're harming us, or at least ask the question, because let's go back to the original thing we don't fully understand autoimmunity in humans. And is it possible that these could be contributing to autoimmunity in some people? Yeah. And then you see it happening, at least anecdotally, with, with stories from the carnivore diet or diets that are elimination type diets. Doesn't even have to be carnivore. It could be autoimmune, paleo, you know, animal-based, which is organs, meat, fruit, honey, and raw dairy. 